Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Every week, EWTN allows me to interview a variety of folk as they talk about the different ways that the Holy Spirit opened their hearts to the beauty of the church. Every one of us has a different journey. We come through different challenges, uh, many of which were not our choosing, but there are often ways as we look back and we recognize that God used those to awaken us to his love, to his grace, and his mercy. The question is, are we able to receive that? And that's a part of our journeys. And uh, that might be a little bit of our journey tonight as we and, uh, welcome to the Journey Home program, Dawn Eden, a convert from Judaism. Hello, Dawn. Thank you so much. It's a joy it, to be on. It's Marcus. great to have you on the program. I, I know that uh, my producer said you've had a couple other opportunities to be on EWTN, right? To yes. Talk uh, thankfully, I've been on Life on the Rock, and I've also been on Faith and Culture. Oh, great, great. And each of those different programs has a different perceived audience, but it's good to have you here, particularly to talk about your spiritual journey. Uh, and you've written a couple books that deal with some of these issues, but on our program we'll give you a chance to, especially your journey from Judaism, but that wasn't your, it wasn't a one-stop journey for you, right? <laughs> that's, uh, that's right. I go to school now studying theology at uh, a seminary, uh, the Pontifical Faculty of the Immaculate Conception at Dominican House of Studies, and many most of my schoolmates are seminarians who go through a period when they're a transitional deacon. So I like to joke <laughs> that there was a period when I was a transitional Protestant. <laughs> All right. Well, even before that, I'll invite you, if you would, Dawn, to take a long step back and give us a little glimpse of your early spiritual journey. I'll be delighted. Thank you. Sure. Well, uh, I was born into a Jewish household. Uh, I have one sister, five years older, who is now a rabbi. Really? Uh, I, yes, <laughs> yes, that's right. My, my parents divorced. I also have a brother from my dad's second marriage who is now a doctor in Tel Aviv. Really? Wow. Uh, yes. Uh, my parents split when I was five, and I was raised by my mother. We were living in Texas at that time, although we're from uh, New York. And I had always, as far, as long ago as I can remember, I always had a longing for God. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was about five, writing a letter to the rabbi of our temple. I wish I still had a copy of this letter. <laughs> I don't, but I have the rabbi's reply, and I can pretty much remember what I wrote to him. I was writing to him about a dispute that I had had with my know-it-all older sister <laughs> because my sister said that when she grew up she wanted to be president of the world and I told her <laughs> little five-year-old me that she couldn't be president of the world because God is president <laughs> of the world so uh, my uh, my rap I wrote this to, to our rabbi and our rabbi uh, wrote uh, back and uh, he pointed out that while I was correct uh, theologically uh, that uh, my sister had apologized to me for I guess taking a heated tone arguing with me and, and he said that in doing so she had acted very Jewishly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now there are a, a variety of streams of Judaism. The, the one that you were brought up in, was it an act of faith? It was reform, and uh, the faith had been uh, fairly watered down by the time it got to us. Hmm. Uh, now, you know, even beginning to discuss this, I have to be sensitive to the fact that my parents are, are, are watching. Sure, of and course. And each of my parents has their own very deep emotional and spiritual tie to the Jewish faith. So. When I say that the faith had been watered down, I'm really speaking in terms of practice and ritual right. and how much it really shaped our lives. And I didn't have a strong sense as a child that it shaped every aspect of our yeah. life. It was something that we did on Shabbat and on holidays. I did go to Hebrew school, uh, which, was, which was on uh, Sundays. Uh, so I was taught about the faith, but in terms of everyday life, the impression that I got of God was more a deist kind of God, a blind watchmaker. 
it wasn't a uh, God who was uh, very intimately part of us, mm. sustaining us in being and guiding all things through divine providence. Okay, not one that you might pray to on a day-by-day -day basis to ask to intervene in your life in some way. He's there, but he's there. That's right. I mean, I certainly knew that I could pray, but I thought of prayer more in terms of asking favors and not in terms of really growing in holiness and okay. becoming more like God. Right. Now, there are Jews who are uh, who are more religious in the mm -hmm. conservative and particularly in the in the orthodox uh, branches of Judaism who who make God more of an intimate part of their their lives and uh, really concentrate more on holiness. With me, certainly I was taught right and wrong, but it was from more of a kind of ethical basis, like what C.S. Lewis calls the Tao, the kind of ethics that's the foundation mm -hmm. of all religions, rather than something that was distinctively Jewish in terms of uh, in terms of halacha, the, the walk yep. towards holiness. All right. So you, you family experiences a breakup and you end up in Texas. Yes, yes, that's, that's right. And so uh, my mother was raising uh, myself and my, and my sister. And my father, I remarried a year after the divorce. And a few years after that, he moved away. He was not very present in my life when mm -hmm. I was young. Mm -hmm. And my mother at that time uh, was searching and tried to find herself in different ways. Uh, it was the 1970s. Uh, the me generation, as you know, it yeah. was the time of self-help movements such as Werner Erhard and Est. Uh, yeah. My mother was a psychologist and social worker, uh, so she was very much keyed into uh, those, uh, those things and uh, experimented with various New Age uh, hmm. movements. And at the same time, uh, my, my mother was seeking love. Um, and looking back, uh, as I have hinted at in my first book, The Thrill of the Chaste, and as I uh, speak more about in my latest book called My Peace I Give You, Healing Sexual Wounds with the Help of the Saints, I realized that as a child uh, in my mother's home, I was in a sexually porous household. Uh, there weren't clear boundaries that I can remember. I wasn't well shielded from adults' nudity, uh, sex talk, uh, or uh, substance uh, abuse. Uh, and as a result, from an early age, I suffered sexual uh, abuse, uh, in particular from one of my mother's boyfriends. Yeah. And I, although as I mentioned to you, I had a, a sort of natural faith um, over time, my personal dialogue with God uh, diminished. Uh, I did become a bat mitzvah at 13, uh, but after going through that rite of passage, becoming an adult uh, in the Jewish faith, I fell into agnosticism. And looking back, I'm able to see that it's because of being unable to understand why God would have permitted such evil in my life. Yeah. You mentioned C.S. Lewis is uh, identifying a kind of a ground level morality that's within us. Yes. Okay. But it seems that your, your early life also addresses the issue of formation of conscience. You have this ground level, but if you have an environment of ideas and examples that are challenging that conscience, that can make a confused conscience. Yes, that's right. Does that identify what you were going through at that Yes, time? it does very much so. And that lack of a well-formed conscience affected my decisions as an adult. Uh, when I wrote uh, The Thrill of the Chaste, uh, back, uh, I, was write, I was writing it in 2005, I had yet to confront uh, my own uh, wounds uh, from abuse. But I was aware that I had failed to learn 
as a child what chastity was, what was the true value of human sexuality as God had created it. And uh, because of that lack of understanding, I acted out as a teenager and young adult. Now, with the benefit of, of understanding better the wounds of abuse, I also realize that I, as a teenager and young adult, was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. And so I, when I was acting out uh, sexually as a teen and young adult, I was dissociating. Inside, and I'll explain what that is, inside I felt like this wounded child, that people weren't going to protect me. The dissociation is the separation from one's true self to create a false self out of a desire to protect oneself. So I thought as a teen and young adult that since p people were going to abuse me, since men were going to objectify me, I might as well control how they were going to do that uh, by presenting myself in a very sexually provocative and aggressive way. And, you know, of course, the, the terrible irony is that in doing so, I was attracting just the sort of people who would be predators. Yeah, all right. Well, the, the problem there, you talk about an inside and outside and the, and the yes. discrepancy between the two. I guess that the majority of people don't know that they're doing that. No, no, they don't know at all. They just think that they're trying to protect themselves. And I think that very often, uh, not always, because certainly there are young people who simply wish to follow the styles and the crowd. Right. But I think that very often when you see young people who are covered with tattoos or wearing spikes or, or, or uh, women having crew cuts or trying very hard to look aggressive and hard. It's because there's some kind of Something. woundedness. Something. We can't be for sure, but there's... No, no, you can't be but, for sure. But woundedness takes a lot of different... Yes, it does. ...flavors, you know, yes, it really right. does. So we don't know what that woundedness could be. That's uh, right. So you're moving on into agnosticism. Yes, that's right. At, at that point in your life. By ch um, cognitively, I mean, you really were choosing that or you were just not taking time for God? I always felt that if there were truth, there would be one truth. I felt that deeply inside, and I do believe that that is thanks to having been exposed to the Old Testament at an early mm. age. I always loved the, the, the Bible from childhood. You know, there are certain moments in one's life that one looks back at and thinks, that's got to be divine providence. And one of them was at the reception following my sister's bat mitzvah, I remember there being a little girl there younger than me uh, with her father. I was seven at the, at the time. And I don't remember really knowing this little girl or her father, uh, but they were somehow friends of the family and they were Christian. And the father, I remember saying that his daughter had something to give me. Since my sister was getting so many presents for her bat mitzvah. You know, some people took pity on me and wanted to give me something. So I remember this very shy little girl, you know, like sucking her thumb, too shy to even say anything, handing me this, this large package. And I opened it, and it was uh, Barbara Taylor Brad Bradford, future uh, romance novelist, children's stories from the Old and New Testament. And I remember that there was an image of the Last Supper on the cover. And even at the age of seven, I knew enough to know that that wasn't from our Bible. <laughs> and I thought, is this father stupid? Doesn't he realize he's at a bat mitzvah reception? <laughs> and this is the wrong kind of Bible to give me? But I loved reading. And I found myself uh, reading all the way through that, uh, that book. And one thing that I noticed at that young age was that there wasn't a radical divide between the Old Testament stories and the New Testament stories, that it was really the same God. Now, I knew from my parents that we said that Jesus was a good man, he just wasn't God. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so I couldn't really believe in being a Christian, but I could believe that Jesus truly was a, a good man. And there's something else that I would love to, uh, to share uh, w with you, which is that, you know, it's very common for children after a divorce to have fears, phobias, because their world has been 
upended, yeah. and now they feel like any other kind of disaster could strike. Yeah. So at the age of seven, um, a couple of years after my parents split, uh, you know, at school they would have the firemen come in and show us the film showing how quickly children's pajamas burn in a fire if they're not flame retardant. So, you know, I got these <laughs> images in my head thinking, you know, what if the house burns down while I'm sleeping and I'm not able to get out, that sort of thing. So I made a deal with God at the age of seven, and I you know, feel like crying when I remember this. Yeah. I told God that I would read from these children's stories from the Old and New Testament every night before bed. And if I did this, that he had to protect me. And so uh, I realized uh, now you are. that he, exactly <laughs> that here I am. And that even though on the one hand, I wasn't protected from, from certain bad things during my childhood, in the larger sense, I have been protected because God used all of these yeah. things, including the evils, to draw me. Well, and, and that's one of the keys which you mentioned in your books is yes. that God, whenever those evils were there, it doesn't mean God wasn't. That that's there was right. a mystery of His, the way He works in our lives. There's a real mystery there that we have to accept. That's right. So you're into agnosticism. Is this their high school years, you mean? Yes, in, into that's college? right. Is yes, the, high school and into college. And here's another moment that I remember when I was in college. I was going to New York University, living in a dorm right on Washington Square Park. And I have to tell you, it, it ain't Mayberry. <laughs> <laughs> Especially, Especially the accent. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. And so this was during the late uh, 1980s. <laughs> and I remember one day this young woman standing on, uh, it must have been uh, Waverly Place, right uh, at the corner of the park, saying, free Bible, free Bible. And, you know, I you know, thought for a moment, and I was like, okay. And I took one, and it was one of those little green Gideon's Bibles yep. of the Psalms and New Testament. Yep. And I, I took it because I just thought that it was something I should own. And it stayed on my shelf for many uh, years. And it, it, some um, nearly 15 years later, when I uh, finally uh, started to be open to grace, it was that Bible that was given <laughs> me <laughs> on the streets of New York City that That's I turned great. to. So I want to really encourage people who are watching to keep planting those seeds mm -hmm. uh, because because one plants the other waters, God gives the yeah. increase, and you just never know. Yeah, you never know. Well, that's how I feel about this program. We, we never know when one person's story will be just the story for the right person. It's really true. Say. It's really true. Oh, and there was another important moment that I should share with you, which is that when I was in eighth grade, there was a social studies teacher, Mr. Owen Snyder. Uh, this was at the South Orange Middle School in northern New Jersey. We had moved back up north by then. And this, this teacher said, since it was an advanced class, I was a smart kid. <laughs> <laughs> he said that if we were going to truly understand Western civilization, we had to study the Gospels. It was a largely Jewish class. Hmm. It was New oh. Jersey suburbia. But somehow, and this was, you know, 1981, 82, goodness knows if this could happen today, but somehow he was able in a public school to go through the Gospels with us. And among the things that he showed us was something which you will know is such an important interpretive key to understand, which is that he asked the question, now, what do we make of the fact that there are conflicting things in the Gospels when relating the events of Jesus' life. And he said, we have to remember that these are based on eyewitness testimony. And we know that eyewitnesses <laughs> see different things. Now, as a graduate student in theology, I know that there are people who became atheists because they didn't understand. Well, because perhaps they were brought up very fundamentalist, and when they started to read the Bible, they couldn't understand how uh, this one gospel and this other gospel could both be true right. if they conflicted. So t to have learned that at, at a young age and have absorbed that even though I didn't yet have faith, I take that as a, as a real Again, blessing. a planting seed of, of God. At that yes. Point. So what was it and when when you started moving on your agnosticism? Well, this was a really amazing thing. You know, God meets us where we are. And <laughs> if we just have even the slightest 
crack open in the door of our hearts, God will find that entrance. In my case, I was 27 years old, and I was a music journalist interviewing rock musicians, and that was my life, and I, and I loved it. And uh, I, I was also suffering from uh, cyclical suicidal depression, which yeah. I now realize was from the post-traumatic stress the disorder. Past, yeah. It was not diagnosed uh, accurately at the time. Uh, and I also was living this lifestyle of looking for love through giving myself uh, away, and that too was very unhappy. I was doing a telephone interview with a Los Angeles rock musician uh, from a band called The Sugar Plastic. His name is Ben Eschbach. And the, the Sugar Plastic were not a Christian band, so I wouldn't have expected a Christian answer to a question. But I asked Ben what was he reading lately, and he said that he was reading a book by G.K. Chesterton called The Man Who Was Thursday, a novel. I had never heard of G.K. Chesterton, so I just thought, I'll pick up this book just so that I can read it and impress Mr. Eschbach the next time he comes to town. And so I had no idea that Chesterton was this great convert to the Catholic faith from Anglicanism, who had himself gone through a dark yeah. night of, of near atheism. I had no idea that he was the man whom C.S. Lewis credits with converting him from atheism. And so I picked up this book and started reading it. And I, first of all, thought it was a great novel. But secondly, I started to get an impression of Christianity because I realized as I was reading it that there was this whole subtext of, of the journey to towards Christ, seeking his face. And I realized that, according to Chesterton, Christian faith was a rebellion. Chesterton, in the book, has this character who considers himself a poet of uh, anarchy, and he contrasts this with a poet who's a poet of law and order. And I myself thought that in order to be creative, an individual, I had to be against whatever Christians were for. Mm. But uh, Chesterton presented the true rebel as the one who's rebelling for truth, for beauty, for law and order against a world that's fallen into darkness. And this intrigued me, uh, particularly one line that Chesterton has in the voice of the poet of law and order. He is arguing with the anarchist poet about what constitutes true poetry, and he says, the most poetical thing in the world is not being sick. And I read that and I was very touched by that because I longed for that kind of poetry, the poetry of not being sick. I, it awakened this longing in me to have my life ordered from the top down. And so I couldn't really believe that there were other salty Christians like Chesterton. I still thought that Chestertons were this kind of amorphous, conformist, moral majority mass. And I still thought the only way I could be individual and have my own identity, which I desperately wanted, was to be not Christian. But I was curious enough to read more Chesterton. And over the course of four years of reading a lot of Chesterton, that eventually, praise God, brought me to taking that <laughs> green Gideon's uh, New Testament and Psalms off the shelf. So it wasn't the apologetic of G.K. Chesterton, because it isn't really an apologetic you get when you read him, but it is a, it's almost a culture, it's a, it's a concept of Christ it's, that you were catching in the process. Yes, well, The Man Who Was Thursday, although Chesterton does have other apologetic works, that particular novel, you're, you're right, is not an apologetic. It's just an exciting novel, it's a spy yeah. novel. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, in reading it as a friend of mine who's Jewish, who loves that novel, put it, it's, you learn that that uh, that which you are seeking with fear and trepidation, and trepidation is actually seeking you with love. So G.K. Chesterton made the step to the church. Did he cause you to make the step to the church at that point? I was fighting it, Marcus, <laughs> uh, because I uh, was at that time in a state of codependency with my mother, which is, uh, again, something that not always, but can 
often happen mm -hmm. with people who have suffered sexual abuse in a in a home where uh, they had someone who was uh, supposed to be protecting them uh, they can d develop a kind of Stockholm syndrome where they have an unhealthy bond with the person who was supposed to be protecting them because they feel like well if this person wasn't here then I'd really have been hurt oh. so uh, the par as part of this bond I um, identified with my mother and one of the ways that I identified with her was in her um, in her uh, sort of suspicion towards or distaste for the Catholic faith. She had actually, when I was a teenager, come to the Catholic faith and oddly enough this was through me uh, because <laughs> when I was 16 and looking at colleges we were at Rutgers University and there was a table of good news Bibles there and at this time my mother was going to weekly meetings of a guru named Hilda who was and these meetings were at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New, in New York totally new age environment mm. and I was uncomfortable with my mother following this guru and my mother saw this table of good news Bibles at Rutgers and she picked one of the books up and she said tongue in cheek, what do you think Don? should I read this? And I said, oh yes mom, we read it in school, it's good, you should read it. Because I thought just anything to get her away from this guru and at least here she'll be getting something that's ethical and that might introduce some stability to her life. So she read it and she got converted and she entered uh, the church. Uh, but uh, she didn't remain in the Catholic faith long. Uh, she, uh, within a couple of years, had become drawn to a uh, Messianic Jewish temple. Uh, Messianic Judaism is really a form of Protestantism that uses Jewish prayers. And uh, she, um, I, she, I can't really speak for her, right. but she felt that she was being fed in a way there, that she wasn't right. being fed at the Catholic uh, church. So by the time I received faith, which was 15 years after my mother, um, she was thoroughly Protestant and she had a sort of laundry list of reasons why the Catholic Church was unbiblical. So I fought entering the church for about five years. All right, let's pause there, Don. We'll come back from the break because you didn't go right from Judaism to agnosticism into the Catholic Church. You had a little pause in there yourself. So when we come right. back from the break, let's look at that. All right. Okay. See you there. Welcome back to The Journey Home. Our guest tonight is Dawn Eden. We took a little pause in your journey and during the break, uh, we both remembered an old line from an old Beatles tune from a song called Rocky Raccoon, where the, the line was uh, only to find Gideon's Bible. Yes, right? that's right. <laughs> and in the song, that was the turning point. Yes. Was that your turning point? <laughs> it was, because after four years of reading Chesterton, I wanted to read what had influenced <laughs> Chesterton. So I started reading the Psalms, the New Testament, and I, and I have to say that my mother was very much a part uh, of my journey mm. uh, because, first of all, my mother had been praying for my conversion for a long time, mm. and, uh, and during the time when she identified as Catholic, she was particularly asking St. Monica's prayers uh, uh, for me, yeah. St. Augustine's mother who right. prayed so fervently for her son to enter the church. And uh, during a time when I was in a, a situation at work where I was being uh, mistreated, I was working as a uh, writer and editor for a, an entertainment website, my mother advised me to read uh, Psalm 27 every day, which I did, and I started to feel 
strengthened by that. Uh, and then there, there came uh, one, one night when I had uh, what is called, uh, there's a fancy schmancy name for it, a hypnagogic experience. It's just one of those experiences where you wake up during the night and your uh, mind hasn't yet told your body that it can move. So you feel kind of frozen in bed, but you're conscious. And uh, I remember having this experience during like the wee small hours and being uh, very uh, frightened at not being able to move for a moment. But then um, hearing this voice, which was a woman's voice, and uh, the voice said very clearly and distinctly, some things are not meant to be known. Some things are meant to be understood. And uh, I was able to sort of shake myself awake, and I was really, you know, distressed and just wondering, you know, what could what could this mean? I wasn't used to supernatural occurrences, and of course, when you're on medication for depression, you wonder, you know, is this the meds? Uh, but I have to say, if it was the meds, then God's providence was in the meds because I am far happier now than I was ever uh, bef on, when I was on any medication. <laughs> because that day, as I was contemplating, what could this mean? Some things are not meant to be known. Some things are meant to be understood. I felt moved in my heart to open up the Bible to Romans 5.1, not knowing what was there. You're smiling, you know what's there. And I read, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the, the verse goes on to talk, the chapter goes on to talk about suffering yeah. and how, and, and how uh, we have hope through our suffering because mm -hmm. of the love that the Holy Spirit pours into our hearts. And as I read that I, and contemplated it, I realized that I had been trying to get to know God through external knowledge, through thinking, well, if I have enough evidence that faith is real, uh, then I will believe it. But what God was calling me to do was to get the understanding which comes through faith, and that if I trusted Him, then the knowledge would be added to me. Uh, so, and again, here I have to thank uh, my mother. She was an instrument of divine providence. I asked my mother, what do I do now? Because she was, she was the only Christian that I was close to. And she uh, said that I should get down on my knees before bed and pray the sinner's prayer, which is a Protestant yeah. prayer, very much like the act of contrition, admitting being a sinner and asking Jesus Christ to enter into your heart. Uh, so I got down on my knees feeling very stupid and foolish and, 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 and pray, praying it. You know, it's, it's so interesting. Years later, I would read St. Thomas on uh, why does God choose to work through physical things in the sacraments. And he says that man, in disobeying God, put physical things above spiritual things. So God uses physical things to humble us, to draw us back up to spiritual things. <laughs> and I, I realize that now in looking back at the act of kneeling and, and praying this prayer. And then I woke up and the first thing I felt when I woke up was that I no longer had permission to be suicidal, to think about any kind of self-harm because God loved me and God had a plan for me and therefore I had to learn to be happy and as I like to say I've been learning to be happy ever <laughs> since. <laughs> so that was really the beginning for me and I had that experience which I'm sure many people have told you of the experience of having read the Bible before and it just seemed like words flat on a page. Once I read Romans 5.1 that was the first time when the words came alive. Yeah. They were no longer black and white, they were technicolor. And it, it became uh, not just flat words, but a person, the voice of God speaking directly to my heart. Yeah. And, and that, that remained. Now you, you have this awakening yes. as a gift of God's grace, but you're still not connected to any community yet. 
That's right. So I found the first Christian community that I could find, which was a local seed church uh, planted by the Adventists. Uh, but the thing was that I was still very determined not to be a joiner. I thought of myself as this great nonconformist. So I thought, well, I'll get baptized, but I'm not going to be an Adventist. I'm still going to search you know, for where I feel most comfortable, and I don't want to be tied to this one denomination. So I asked the pastor there if he would give me a generic baptism, not making any Adventist vows, and he did. And I can tell you, uh, Marcus, I know it was a valid baptism, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, because it took place in a tank, and I was dunked three <laughs> times. You know, I baptize you, Don, in the name of the Father. <laughs> you know, I was sputtering, but I was thoroughly baptized. And from there, I began church hopping. And, you know, the, the verse that had really converted me was that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I wanted that mm. peace in my heart. And so I would go to different churches trying to get worked up in the Holy Spirit and find that peace. And, you know, there are, th 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 wherever the baptized are together, God is with them. Yep. As so I was able to, f to find in different places the presence of the Holy Spirit, but th there was no real ground uh, from, which, uh, from which I could uh, find the peace that lasts. Mm -hmm. So I would have peace on Sunday, but then by Tuesday <laughs> I'd be, <laughs> I, I'd be uh, antsy. I, I was suffering from anxiety which I now know was one of the effects of post-traumatic stress disorder uh, from the childhood abuse, yeah. which uh, wasn't diagnosed until later. But at the time, as a Protestant, I thought that the remaining anxiety showed a lack of faith because I thought, I know in my faith that God created me in love. I know he doesn't want me to harm myself or entertain suicidal thoughts ever again. So therefore, God doesn't want me to be anxious. I shouldn't be anxious. Uh, if I had enough faith, I could move mountains. I should pull myself up by my bootstraps. You know, these are yeah. the kind of things that one, uh, that one thinks without a Eucharistic understanding yeah. of, uh, of faith and redemptive uh, suffering. Um, so I kept and I would say that, that I want to miss, make a little just correction because I remember from my own background I would I would have been hesitant to say as a evangelical Protestant that I was called to pull myself up my bootstraps because I would have said no I'm I'm to surrender to Jesus yes. you know it's faith in Jesus that's right but what you were also hearing I'm guessing is that there was this kind of floating theology that says that if you're still having this lack of peace this all these other bad thoughts, it's because you don't believe enough. There's what you need to do. You need to that's, give yourself that's more right. and it, surrender more to and Jesus. And it is very important to, to say that, that not every Protestant uh, denomination at all has that, right. that idea. Um, but even the idea that one is not sufficiently surrendered implies that there is a certain kind of work that is more than just a turning yeah. Of, of the, it of comes the back will. to you. And you haven't given yourself exactly. enough yet. You're, you're still holding something back yet. There's, there's a reason you're going through this stuff. Uh, you haven't given, you haven't let go. Exactly. Enough. And I mean, people talk about Catholic guilt, but I had Protestant guilt. <laughs> <laughs> and the way that, uh, that I found that peace was actually through the communion of saints. I was working at the New York Post. I managed to get out of the music business because I had found that that, that was a dangerous mm -hmm. environment for me as a new Christian. I was starting to, to live chastely. Um, and I was becoming very pro-life. I had started a blog called The Dawn Patrol, and I had joined the New York City Chesterton Society, <laughs> meeting a lot of Catholics through that. My Catholics used to try to get me to ask the intercession of saints. And as a Protestant, I thought, well, that's a very slippery slope, because even if Catholics say, oh, it's just like asking a friend to pray for you, I thought, well, you know, you know it's, it's so close to idolatry, that there's a danger that I might put too much power in the saint. And, you know, as a Protestant, you know, you believe that, that you can go to hell for that. And, and actually, you know, if you, if one were idolatrous, that, that would be yeah. something for which one could go, go to hell. So I was very wary of saints, but I was in a situation at work uh, one day in January 2005, where I 
uh, it felt that I really badly needed a friend in heaven. I was about to get fired from the New York Post because as a copy editor, I had made a change that was not in my power to change. I was given a story that was very anti-life to copy edit. And it was not an op-ed, it was a hard news story. And it was so biased against life that I, without anyone's permission, <laughs> changed it, made it a pro-life story. <laughs> and then, you know, when it came out, the reporter was furious, insisted th that I be fired. And so uh, there, there was this time when I was waiting for the ax to fall. And I decided, okay, I've failed everyone. I've failed my employer, and I've failed God, because it says right there in Ephesians, serve your employer as you would serve the Lord. So I thought, if I'm already on the outs with God, I can't get any more on the outs with Him by asking a saint's help. Uh, so I went online to the patron saints uh, in index, and I looked up patron saint journalists. I found St. Maximilian Kolbe. Oh, wow. Franciscan <laughs> Friar started a publishing operation yeah. in the uh, first half of the 20th century, uh, spreading devotion to, uh, to Jesus through Mary, and was sent to Auschwitz yeah. by the Nazis when they invaded Poland um, because of his writing about truth. And uh, the Nazis were not in favor of Christian right. truth. And so uh, at Auschwitz, uh, St. Maximilian offered to take the place of uh, another inmate who was condemned to death. And as I was reading his story, I got to the end of the story uh, and I saw that the prisoner whose life St. Maximilian saved was present at St. Maximilian's canonization by John Paul more than 30 years later. And I just broke down crying. And I started finally doing what my Catholic friends had been trying to get me to do. I just started talking to St. Maximilian like I would talk to a friend, saying, Dear St. Maximilian, I'm in trouble. I'm about to be fired. Please pray for me. And at those words, whoosh, I felt the Holy Spirit come down. And I felt this grace flowing from heaven as though I were at the eye in the middle of the storm mm. in this place of calm. And I found this great peace and I realized that no matter what happened to me, I was going to be okay because just in asking St. Maximilian to pray for me, I've been brought in line with God's will, whereas I hadn't been before. It just opened up the communion of saints for me, and I, I, I um, feeling God's peace through the communion of saints, I chased that peace into the Catholic Church. <laughs> the, um, did you share this with any of your evangelical friends? I mean, what did they think about this at this point, or with your family, this, this awakening that you experienced because of Maximilian? I mean, what a, what a great saint to, to have God lead you to at that point. My evangelical friends knew about it, but since I'd really not uh, stayed very close with evangelical um, communities, I didn't have a lot of people sort of coming up with intervention teams yeah. to try to get me away from the Catholic faith. I did have a lot of blog readers, and actually I heard afterwards from, from more than one of them that they had since entered the church, and I wasn't the only one. They were reading other blogs of people who either were Catholic or had converted to Catholic. So again, you know, you, we plant these seeds, we never mm -hmm. know where they go. So you read Chester 10 and you, you ask uh, Colby for his intercession, but you really hadn't entered a Catholic church, had you, at this point? No, I, I hadn't. Uh, I went into RCIA and was received at the Church of Notre Dame uh, back when it was run by Polish Dominicans uh, in New York City, near Columbia University. And as a new Catholic, I, uh, I rejoiced in being able to live in the sacraments and in the communion of the, of the Church, but I still felt anxiety. Mm -hmm. But I knew now that it had to have some kind of meaning, and I, I was asking God, what did he mean by leaving me with this thorn, as he did for <laughs> St. Paul? Yeah. And the answer came to me a couple of years ago on a retreat, and this was the kind of image that came to me that inspired my new book, My Peace I Give You, on healing from the wounds of childhood sexual abuse. It was when I was on this Ignatian retreat two years ago, praying before the Blessed Sacrament, uh, that I had this mental image come to me mm -hmm 
of the Eucharist in the Tabernacle as being like the center of a great bicycle wheel with rays mm. going uh, from it through, to, throughout the world, taking up the entire world in it, in its embrace, and bringing everything back to the Eucharist. Mm. And as I meditated on what that could mean, I realized that the Christ we receive is the, in the Eucharist is the resurrected and glorified Christ, the Christ who suffered, who was wounded for us, and whose wounds are now glorified. St. Thomas tells us that the Eucharist has the effect of healing us uh, because Christ has always had this will to suffer for us. He has suffered, and now he's in some sense the product of his suffering. And I realize that when I am really present for Christ in the Eucharist, I in some sense am the product of what I suffered. And uh, that was what made me realize that it's not my wounds don't separate me from Christ. It's not in spite of my wounds that he heals me. It's just the opposite. When I'm really present for Christ, then my wounds become the cracks that his light gets in. And it's through my wounds that I can draw on a closer union with the wounded and resurrected Christ. I can still ask him for healing, and, and I do. But at the same time, I can rejoice knowing that he uses all my suffering to to gain merit for myself and for, and for the, those I love. You described, I'm sure you're describing a little bit of yourself, but you described people who have this, this protective false image that they've, they've erected around themselves that they may be blind to themselves. It's an image that other people see that protects it inside uh, from great wounds of the past. Uh, what would you like to say if anyone's watching, that is, if they're becoming aware of this because of wounds of their past, how do they move forward towards healing? I would say, first of all, if you have wounds from the past, it's very important to open up about them to someone close to you whom you trust. If there's no one uh, in your uh, family or among your close friends to whom you can speak, uh, to seek out a good spiritual uh, director. Um, there are also therapists. I would highly recommend a Catholic therapist. I had bad experiences with a secular uh, th therapist. Um, so first of all, speak to someone. Uh, se second of all, realize that nothing is wasted with God. I know now that whatever suffering I have undergone, whatever uh, re remnants of suffering, uh, the past, uh, effects of the past evils remain in me, and whatever new suffering I may experience, God can use all of this to open my heart towards others. And it's, it's very important for us to not uh, focus so much on our woundedness as on the fact that there must be something in us that's good that enables us to even have a wound. You can't have a wound in something that's blank. There has to be something there, some goodness. And the key is to ask God to show us how to stop acting from our woundedness and stop acting from our pathology and how to start acting from our wellness. Because it's, it's when we do that that we are able to be a light to others and grow in grace. Yeah, you, you mentioned in, in one of your books, as I, I didn't get a chance to read it all yet, but uh, you point out Dorothy Day and others. And, yes. and I'm reminded of a, a great Catholic spiritual writer from about 200 years ago, Father Gros, who was a Jesuit priest during the French Revolution, got kicked out of France, and he wrote some spiritual, wonderful spiritual books. I think that I think they're available on EWTN's website and the uh, in the texts in the library. But I remember one point he was writing about people that were so absorbed in whether they're saved or not. Am I saved? Or did this get saved? Um, am I justified? And and he was saying, you know, when you think about all that, that's all self-centeredness. Yes. You're so absorbed in this stuff. You think you're really all about God, but you're really all about yourself. He said there's three things that are important. One, give glory to God. Number one, that's what it's about. Yes. Focusing on the glory of God. Number two is being like Him, holiness. That's what it's about. Yes. Thirdly, salvation, leave it to Him. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. I mean, really, even this, the people that are struggling with issues in the past, we can get so inward on them. The really part of the journey out is giving glory to God. 
Absolutely. And that's why in, in the book that you mentioned, uh, my piece I give you, Healing Sexual Wounds with the Help of the Saints, I focus towards the end of the book on the what the Second Vatican Council called our universal call to holiness, showing how there are saints who were wounded in childhood, including saints who suffered childhood sexual abuse, who uh, grew, drew closer to God and became lights for others, not in spite of their wounds, but because of their wounds, because they sought from, from God to, to um, have, their, have their wounds dr draw them into closer union with, with his passion. We've got an email. Terry from Omaha writes, in a culture that doesn't seem to think anything is wrong with living together before you are married or having multiple sexual partners, how can I present Catholic teaching on morality to my young adult friends in a way that they would understand and relate to? I don't want to come across as prudish, but I'd love some ideas for how to communicate the importance of chastity to my friends who don't know any better. It's a great question, and I think we all want to live in the truth. John Paul II, in his Catechesis on Human Love, also known as the Theology of the Body, speaks about the importance of, of using God's gift of, of our being embodied to show His light and His truth to others. And we can only do this by living truly. To engage in what is a marital act, an act that God designed to take place within marriage, outside of marriage, is to lie. It's to uh, pretend I'm making this self-gift, but to really be withholding the gift of permanence and the gift of uh, being willing to be present for someone when they're old, when they're not able to take care of themselves. It's withholding the gift of being willing to, to not only love, but to suffer with, mm -hmm. the, with the other as Christ uh, s suffered uh, w w with and for us. Uh, so I would definitely uh, encourage uh, Terry to tell mm -hmm. the young people about living in the truth. And yeah, when I think about your whole story and, and what you've written, it, it it seems to me that one of the issues is you, there could be a wounded person that's just so caught up in their wounds, maybe yes. even suicide. And then there's the, the positive development where people might see that person, see there's a person that's really got themselves together uh, and maybe they have the person that's got faith and it's a person mm -hmm. that's, that's given themselves to God. But in the end, the, what we want them to say is when they look at us, they see Jesus. Yes. That's the goal. They don't see us, they see a person changed by Jesus. And it's about Him. And the people I know who are most like Jesus, and here I think of a dear uh, Jesuit I knew, Father Francis Canavan, SJ, a professor emeritus at Fordham who passed away a few years ago. The people who are most like Jesus were the people who showed their vulnerability. Father Canavan was very involved with his local chapter of Calix, C-A-L-I-X, which is a Catholic society for people who are struggling with alcoholism. Mm. And he wrote books of essays or to talks mm. for C Calix. He was willing to show his own woundedness and his own journey of, uh, of healing through Christ, a journey of spiritual healing that was ongoing. And, and so it, people were able to look at him in his own vulnerability mm. and, and his own seeking holiness and see Christ in that. Wow, real quick email. Might need a quick answer. Carrie from Massachusetts, what are Dawn's thoughts on the role of Catholic women in society today? How can we work to affect the world while being true to who we are as Catholics? By seeking to win over one piece of turf for the Lord. This I got from Father Daniel A. Lord S.J., a great devotional writer. The one piece of turf that we each must win for the Lord is our own soul. I, we, we are not to be self-centered, as, as you said, right. but to seek to be grounded in Christ, as Pope Benedict tells us so often, and to, and to live in and through Christ. That is the best way that we can embody, embody our, our created sex, whether we are a, a, wom a woman or a man. All right. You have a website, dawneden.blogspot.com. That's right. In case anyone in the audience 
wants to get in touch with you. The Dawn Patrol, I call the Dawn, it. The Dawn Patrol. Are you still are, is fighting the Dawn Patrol after all these years? Right, right? Amen. All right, very good. Are you still writing now, journalist? Yes, uh, a, a little, but mostly focusing on my graduate studies. I'm studying towards a pontifical licentiate in theology and hoping to become a professor one day, and also hoping to enter a, a form of, of life in vowed chastity yeah. and, and obedience in the world. I would ask viewers to please pray for my vocation. All right, we'll do that very much. So thank you for your witness, Dawn. Thank you Dawn. so much, God thank bless Thank you very you. much for joining us on the program, for your writing and uh, for being open with God, how God has brought healing in your life through the mercy that he has for, for all of us, right? Even in the midst of our suffering. So Amen. thank you very much. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I pray that Dawn's story touched you, especially some of you that Truly, God was calling to hear this program, to hear her. May God fill your life with his grace. God bless you. See you soon.